The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to a new approach to assessing family engagement in healthcare systems. I'm Bev Johnson, President and Chief Executive Officer, the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. I will be moderating today's discussion. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health website in the coming weeks. This webinar takes a deeper look at a recent issue brief that I hope all of you have read from Family Voices National Office entitled, A Framework for Assessing Family Engagement in Systems Change. Today, we really want to try and bring the concepts from this framework to life, from the development of the framework into a tool for meaningful family engagement to how a parent-led organization and a state agency are using the framework to examine their family engagement efforts and inform future systems-level initiatives. Joining me today are three wonderful experts from the field. Beth Doretsky, a project manager at Family Voices, Nancy Lubago, co-executive director of PATH, uh, Parent to Parent, Family Voices of Connecticut, and Susan Chacon, um, the president of AMCHIP and the Title V director for Children's Medical Services, Children and Youth with Special Healthcare Needs Program in New Mexico. We want this to be really an engaging uh, conversation with all of you out there in the field and with our wonderful speakers today. And we encourage you to submit questions in the GoToWebinar question box. We will try to get to as many as we can today. So please be thinking about those questions that you want to pitch our terrific presenters. Our first presenter, Beth Jurecki, is the team lead for the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool and Toolkit Project. She brings a wonderful depth of experience in family leadership, formerly serving as project director for the Massachusetts Family to Family Health Information Center. Beth will provide an overview of the Family Voices Framework for assessing family engagement. Beth? Thank you for that introduction, Bev, and thanks to everyone for joining. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share information about the framework for assessing family engagement and systems change that Family Voices created with support, of, from, with support from the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. So why do we need a new approach to assessing family engagement at the systems level? And by that we mean in policy, program, practices, and service services and other initiatives that organizations undertake to improve child and family serving systems of care and health outcomes. Increasingly, state agencies, health insurers, hospitals, researchers, and other organizations that serve children and families are expected or even required to engage families in activities beyond the individual family provider level are often limited to asking them to react to policies, programs, practices, and services that were created without their input. And these efforts are often assessed with process measures, for example, the numbers of families and youth who attend a meeting or who participated on a family advisory council. So systems level engagement means including families from the start in the development, implementation, and evaluation of policies, programs, practices, and services. And family engagement at the systems level recognizes the importance of nothing about us without us, the rallying cry of the disability, mo disability movement in the 1990s. It's as meaningful today as it was almost two decades ago as creating or amending um, systems level initiatives must include full and direct participation of the members of the group affected as without the critical input of the individuals of, in, of the individuals and their families um, in that process, there can be unintended consequences that often create barriers when the intention was the opposite, which was to improve a system of care. 
So as an example, many states have created autism mandates so that certain private health insurers have to cover autism services, specifically applied, applied behavioral analysis. However, the way the mandates were written did not take the implementation of those mandates into account. If families who had experience with and knowledge of the difficulties of getting health insurance coverage for autism services had been engaged in the process, they could have pointed out the unintended consequences of, mandate, of mandates that require a child to have a diagnosis of autism in order to receive the services and of the requirements for ABA providers to have certain levels of credentialing in order for the insurance to cover the cost of ABA. This has resulted in barriers in access to care. There are long waiting lists for limited numbers of providers who can make the diagnosis of autism and there's and for the shortage of providers with the level of board certification the mandate specifies. So therefore, a framework that organizations can use to support meaningful um, family engagement and systems initiatives, um, it's very timely for, for this framework as there's a continuous need for families to be engaged in the systems that support the health and well-being of their children and families. I also wanted to um, make it, um, to be clear that the framework is not limited to children and youth with special health care needs. As you'll see on this slide, nothing about us without us is important to, um, to, indivi to more individual, to, um, to more groups than just individuals with disabilities and includes those who are LGBTQ, the elderly, and also there are systems of care that recognize the importance of nothing about us without us, as it's included in the six pillars of learning for the fundamentals of nursing and in the 12 point framework for um, innovations in mental health. Next slide, please. This is the definition that we use um, that we used in the framework, for, uh, the definition of family engagement that we used in the framework with a slight adjustment to recognize that family engagement can mean partnership between organizations and family-led or community-based organizations. For example, a Medicaid program might collaborate with a family-to-family -family health information center to share data, identify a systemic problem and access to care, and work together on systems level on a systems level initiative to address the issue. It also recognizes that organizations, staff, and family leaders can collaborate on a systems level in this initiative, such as writing a grant to fund respite services. Next slide, please. As noted um, in the framework, we identified four domains of family engagement. I'm presenting the domains in a different order than they appear in the framework, and some of the key criteria are different as well. Since the framework was published last April, we've done cognitive testing, and based on what we learned, we've reordered the domains and refined many of the key criteria. So um, I don't want to take a lot of time reviewing the key criteria in each domain that support family engagement, as Nancy and Susan are going to provide specific examples, but I did want to um, to just make a couple of, uh, to distinguish one thing here in the commitment domain. Um, in that support, when we say support, it refers to the peer support, mentoring, and leadership, skill building opportunities that both family leaders and organization staff might need to understand their partnership roles. Compensation is important, is different kind of support because it's important to recognize the costs in both time and real expenses that families can incur by, part by, by fact, be just because they're taking the time to participate. So this might include things like childcare and travel, as well as compensating families. Um, next slide, please. This is the transparency domain. Um, and, um, we incur, uh, and these are some of the key criteria that support transparency. But basically, transparency means giving families um, the information and the materials that they need in a timely manner to ensure that they can participate to the maximum extent possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, representation, um, representation occurs when family leaders reflect the diversity of the community served by the organization. And um, specifically um, when if, if, a, if an organization doesn't have its own internal mechanism for recruiting family members 
who are representative of the race, ethnicity, culture, language, age, gender, disability, and, gre and geographic areas served by, by, their, um, by their organization. It can be helpful um, it can be helpful to partner with a family-led or community-based organization, such as a family-to-family -family health information center mm -hmm. or a community-based organization such as a cultural broker, because these organizations have developed relationships with diverse and medically served under family, uh, underserved families throughout their states, and they have connections and existing relationships um, to, to reach out to reach out and identify and recruit families that may that may be willing to um, to partner in whatever the systems level activity that the organization is undertaking. Next slide, please. So um, the impact domain um, describes areas where family leaders were incorporated at the systems level to improve policies, programs, services, and practice. Um, and it would mean in, um, that family leaders and or organizational and organization partners work together in choosing the goals um, in implementation, evaluation, um, and that what the families say actually has it has actually influenced the the programmatic the options that the organization has chosen. And we also realize that engagement incurs over time. Next slide, please. I mean, that impact occurs over time. Um, so the framework can be used as a checklist to help organizations plan efforts to engage families in system level initiatives. And it, um, it is all uh, internally at Family Voices. We have also used that framework to inform the development of a family engagement and systems assessment tool so that organizations can assess how well and how well it engages families and youth in policies, programs, practices, and services. Um, they can use it to guide the design of systems level activities to ensure family and youth engagement. And they can also use the um, family engagement and systems assessment tool as um, for quality improvement. They can use it over time to assess efforts towards meaningful family and youth engagement. It can also be scored to provide an overall score as well as individual scores for each domain. And we're currently developing a toolkit as a companion to the assessment tool that will have resources and strategies for improving family engagement um, and for improving family engagement. Next slide, please. So um, feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions or you want some more information. And I'm going to turn it back to Bev. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. That was a terrific overview of the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool. Thank you so much. Now, I'm pleased to welcome Nancy Lubogo. Um, Nancy is the wife and mother of three children. Her daughter, Stephanie, was diagnosed with multiple special needs. As a family leader, Nancy has focused on parent-to-parent -parent support with a particular interest in cultural competency, emergency medical services for children and youth with special health care needs, and parent leadership training and development. Nancy will share the parent perspective um, and describe how she helps to engage healthcare agencies and organizations within the context of the four domains that Beth just described to you in the family engagement assessment tool. Nancy? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Bev. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk to you today um, about our family engagement pro project, for which for us um, was a partnership between um, our organization and the New England Regional Genetics Network. Next slide, please. Um, so our partnership um, began actually 10 years with the um, New England Genetics Network. Um, when it was still the NEGC, which was the New England Genetics Collaborative. And it, our partnership began um, when we um, began applying for um, grants through them um, unsuccessfully, but we developed a relationship. And um, then when the NERGEN, NEGC became NERGEN, and um, they were digging into um, family engagement through genetic services as part of their quality improvement projects, 
um, they gave us a call and asked us if we wanted to participate and they were able to write us into their grant um, that they wrote to um, Maternal and Child Health and HRSA. And so I'm going to be talking to you about family engagement through the four domains that um, Bev had mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, it was a partnership and it was a partnership with all, all across the six New England states, um, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And um, our project, particularly at each state focused on um, family engagement as it best suited their state. And in our state, in, in the state of Connecticut, we decided to um, take that approach um, by reaching out through the hospital um, population just to ensure that we got representation from diverse and medically underserved families, because that was one of um, their, Nurgen's biggest criteria, they're trying to reach to um, underserved families. So we reached our families through the neonatal intensive care units, um, through for kids who had just been born and either diagnosed or, or awaiting diagnoses, and um, those that left the NICUs um, and had gotten the birth to three, um, the birth to three uh, referrals. We tried to reach those families too. And then families who were kind of in that gray area where they had gotten a diagnosis and um, were waiting to have another um, appointment with a genetics um, specialist and needed some more information on a diagnosis. They needed more understanding of what the diagnosis was. They needed resources to help them um, make sure that they, number one, knew where to go to, to make their appointment. They had resources to understand what the genetic condition was. Um, so those are the families that we targeted um, as part of our criteria. And some of the other um, states in New England, you know, did had different focuses. And, um, and so we were able to get um, through a small budget through um, NERGEN. Um, I mentioned the New England Genetics Regional Network is called NERGEN, so you'll, you'll hear me say that. Um, and we had a small budget to hire um, one of our staff to focus particularly on um, genetics work. And um, they did a um, genetics 101 training for us. They um, provided resources and um, basically did a lot of technical assistance. So any diagnosis that we came across um, through a family in the NICU or through a birth to three referral or outside, we're able to give um, the families um, information. We're able to go with them on either go into the website, research that information for them, and provide it to them in that way. And um, like I mentioned, we got a small pocket of compensation for that. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the this is so talking about the transparency um, domain that Bev had mentioned. Um, we went about. Um, creating shared language. This was making sure that our, our website, the genetics website, um, Nurgent's genetics website that has a lot of great information was readable to families that they could go on there and un understand the information that they're looking at. The website has 37 um, different genetic conditions and most of it is available um, through the GEMS for School um, Jumps for Schools um, website, which is through the Nurgen website. And it's got some really great, easy um, one-pager information on all those 33, 37 um, conditions. So we're able to give those to um, any teachers that we come into contact with. Families can share them with um, either um, different health providers who are not so familiar with a genetic condition. They can share them with, with their schools. Um, the school nurses and stuff like that. So we kind of were the go-between um, for families so that, you know, um, they were not overwhelmed with a lot of information. So we also reviewed the website um, and made sure that it was easy and um, accessible and user-friendly. Next slide, please. Um, so through the impact um, domain, um, it focuses on improving access. Um, and like I mentioned, there's a lot of genetic conditions. Um, a lot of times when you've just, you're a new family that has just received um, a genetic um, diagnosis, you're completely overwhelmed. And I can speak to that myself as a family member. So we really understand what families are, the difficulties that they have to accessing some of those information, some of the information. And, um, and so 
like I said, we we'll get the info. We we'll, we'll print it out the simple one pages, provide it to them, and then ask them um, that help them to prepare if they had any questions for they help help provide all the specialists um, that we could help them to understand that just some simple questions down to ask the provider. Um, and so that's something that we worked on with um, Nurgen. Um, their staff was available to kind of um, give us the technical assistance, answer any questions that we had, go over any of the materials that were available on the website um, through a series of um, follow-up calls and genetic website webinars. We did a couple of satisfaction surveys. Um, anything that was um, would be provided to families, we had a chance to review first and make sure that those things um, made sense before they went out. Next slide, please. So speaking about commitment, um, the genetics, the New England Genetics Regional Network um, made a commitment um, to, to improve on family engagement. They made a, they've made a long-term investment. So like I said, 10 years in the making our relationship was. And I think this is um, really key for um, those of you who run agencies to remember family engagement takes time. And in order to make, um, to make an investment in it, you have to make a commitment. You have to be dedicated to it. You have to keep trying. It's not always easy. Um, and you, like um, Beth had mentioned in her um, presentation, you have to work with the cultural brokers. Um, so, you know, Nurgen, you, you um, was utilizing our organization as a family to family, as the family voices and as, as a parent to parent, kind of as a cultural broker or in between um, us, in between families and, and health providers, kind of bridging the gap between the two. Next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to to end with this before, actually before I, before I talk about this, I just wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we faced. Um, you know, one of it obviously is um, funding. Funding is always an issue when you're dealing with a, um, a parent organization. And so it was nice to have a little pocket of money um, to be able to do this project. Um, I mean, as a family to family, uh, family voices and parent to parent, we're all an, a community based organization. We do this work all the time. And so it's nice when um, organizations make that commitment and actually put the money behind. Um, so that that was one of the successes to the challenges that we had in trying to reach these families. Um, obviously, you know, I think Beth talked about this. Um, Beth talked about this in her presentation. Working with cultural brokers, um, working with special populations um, is always a challenge because there's a trust factor, um, and we face that with some of the populations that we're trying to reach: the Native American population and the Southeast Asian population. Southeast Asian American community in our state, and um, we're working to address some of these challenges. But it would have been very difficult um, for a, you know an outside agency like Nurgen to come in and try to um, work with this organization if they didn't have us kind of as a go-between. So we're working to address some of those challenges um, and just you know get the material in, in different languages, get, make sure that as I said before, the material um, is is accessible and understandable to families. Um, and so just to close, um, I like this saying um, regarding family engagement, it's a family wisdom kind of part of family engagement. Um, it seems obvious, but it's not always. And it says we join others even as we ask others to join us. I really like this saying because it means that your family engagement is about transformation. It's about you know putting on a different, shift on how um, agencies are used to um, doing their work. And um, this just kind of shows kind of like the circle continuum of care. Um, we join others even as we ask others to join us. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for a wonderful uh, presentation. And I hope you will all follow up with her. Here's her contact information. And um, I love your thought of uh, family wisdom and the mutuality of, of the work that you all do. Um, we've always designed and always and interpreted the kind of collaboration and partnerships um, that we're all working towards as mutually beneficial partnerships. So thank you for sharing with us today. 
And now we are fortunate to hear from Susan Chacon. Um, in her Title V di uh, director role, Susan works to assure a statewide system of coordinated, compassionate, family-centered, and culturally competent care for children who have chronic medical conditions and or disabilities. She also focuses on ensuring access to a range of primary care and specialty service. Uh, Susan will share with us now how New Mexico has engaged families in Title V's work. Susan? Thank you, Bev, and thanks, Beth and Nan, for your, for your presentation. And I'm going to talk to you today about how the New Mexico Title V program incorporated family input into the Title V needs assessment. Title V is the federal maternal and child health block grant that every state and territory receives. It is a federal state partnership whose goal is to improve the service system for the maternal child health population. A comprehensive needs assessment is required every, every five years. Next slide, please. A few facts about New Mexico. Um, we're a minority majority state, so most of our population is non-white. We have very high poverty rates, especially for children. Our southern border borders Mexico, so in the southern regions, our maternal child health issues are binational, and there is a large, diverse Native American population with 19 pueblos and three reservations. We're also a typical western state that has rural and front frontier areas. Next slide, please. As we began our Title V needs assessment, we were very cognizant of the fact that we needed to reflect the diversity of our population. So to start, we convened a panel of experts working in the field of children and youth with special health care needs. And these experts included our community-based family-led organizations, such as Family Voices, Parents Reaching Out, which is home to our Family to Family Health Information System, and EPICS, the Education of Parents of Indian Children with Special Needs, who work closely with Native American families. The panel reviewed various data sets and priority areas were identified. And some of those data sets were the National Survey of Children's Health, um, IDEA, Part B and C, Medicaid data, and some New Mexico specific data sets. After the process was completed, a post evaluation was done, and all members indicated to us that they were involved in the decision-making process and that the decisions accurately reflected the consensus of the group. Next slide, please. Our program was pleased with the initial process, but we still felt we needed more input from families and wanted a way to find, to hear from families in our rural areas and to better reflect our diversity. So we developed a survey based on the priority selected by our expert panel. It was in English and Spanish. We felt we needed to go to places that families were convening to collect additional input. Again, we relied on our community-based family organizations to assist us with this process. Next slide, please. We brought our surveys to several locations. We went to our children's medical services pediatric specialty outreach clinics were located in rural communities across our state. We attended the Family Leadership Conferences hosted by Parents Reaching Out and EPIC's Education of Parents of Indian Children with Special Needs, and the survey was posted on the Family to Family Health Information Center listserv. We had an overwhelming response. Next slide, please. But the results were not what we expected. And of the families we surveyed, child abuse and neglect and behavioral health rose to the top. This kind of put us in a quandary because as, as a Title V program, really our, our purview is around healthcare and healthcare access. So we weren't sure, we, we did a lot of um, thinking about how we were gonna address this and incorporate what we had heard directly from families. So because the, the scoring was so high, we felt that we could not ignore it and we were compelled to include these issues in our needs assessment and state action plan. We decided to create a separate state performance measure for child abuse and neglect and to make behavioral health a cross-cutting issue across all our domains. Next slide, please. 
To truly understand the mater maternal child health needs in your state, engaging diverse family leaders in the Title V block grant is, is essential. And this is a, a list of some of the, the community-based family-led organizations that we work with. And again, that's EPIC, um, works closely with Native American families, Hands and Voices works with families that have a child that's deaf and hard of, or hard of hearing, our Asian Family Center, Tribal Home Visiting Programs, Family Voices, Parents Reaching Out, and the Navajo Family Resource Center. So how do we show our commitment to our family and community-based organizations? We use Title V funding to support leadership conferences and professional development of staff. Both Parents Reaching Out and EPICS have an annual leadership training, and Title V supports scholarships for families to attend. We, part we also provide funding to the, these community-based organizations, so there is family representation at national meetings, such as the Early Hearing Hearing, early Hearing Detection and Intervention Meeting, the Association of Maternal Child Health Meeting, Hands and Voices National. There is family representation on our advisory committees for early hearing detection and intervention, newborn genetic screening, and we utilize family input on program policies and pu publications. We present jointly at conferences, so we, have, we, we try to showcase that family professional partnership uh, we have family participation in our annual title review process. We provide parent training on Title V services. We have mutual support for projects. We write letters of support if we're, if we're submitting grant applications. Um, I can call anyone at any of these organizations if I'm needing help on a project and vice versa. They can reach out to me and I'm happy to assist in any projects. We have clear lines of communication, and most importantly, we are valued and trusted partners, and we can depend on each other. Next slide, please. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Susan. Uh, that was wonderful, and thank you for all the great work that happens in, in New Mexico for, for really decades. I, wonderful to see that it is still going on. Um, uh, really three wonderful presentations, all very thoughtful about this important new tool. Um, there were there have been a number of questions and I hope you're making notes and chatting in your ideas and thoughts uh, to the um, space for, for questions. Uh, I'm going to start dealing with some of them. One of the questions was, what's a cultural broker? Um, either any of you want to answer that question? <clears throat> um, yeah, sure. This is um, Nancy Laboka. I would be happy to answer that. Um, so a cultural broker, um, I can't exactly remember what the technical term is in cultural competence training, but in essence, it means um, a trusted person who is a member of a particular um, community or a particular group that can assist an outside agency or outside people, persons, or person to um, connect with um, the community that you're trying to engage with um, that can assist you because that person is trusted. So you can utilize that person to reach out to and work with that, um, that organization. Um, it's extremely critical. I mean, you would hit roadblocks and hit all the gatekeepers if you did not um, try to utilize this person. And how, but one of the questions is how would you go about finding them? Um, you have to learn a lot about the organization. Um, you can talk to, to people, um, any parents or any agencies that work in the area and ask who would be that um, cultural broker. It doesn't necessarily have to be a person. It could also be like an organization. It could be a community-based organization that's in that community. Um, I don't know Beth and Susan if you wanted to add anything to that. Hi, this is Susan. I, I could add to that. So an example is um, in New Mexico, we, you know, we have many different tribes and we use the, the family-led organizations, specifically EPICS. They work specifically with um, the different tribes and the, the Native American families. We've worked with them for several years to help us 
uh, get the message out around um, newborn hearing screening and the importance of um, follow-up on hearing screening and um, kind of developmental screening watching milestones. And they help us because we probably wouldn't be able to go into a Pueblo and, and do presentations like that, but that's that's their work. So we partner with them and we provide funding so that they can help us get information out to uh, tribal families. <clears throat> That's terrific. There were there were other questions. I think relating back to the assessment tool, in terms of uh, health literacy and cultural competence, um, are uh, Beth or any of the other uh, presenters want to comment on um, how you're going about? Um, finding out about these issues and exploring the issues in more depth um, with the family engagement work. So this is Beth, and I would just ask for some clar clarification. Cultural competence and health literacy of the actual tool or as a key criteria? I think that I'm not sure that I had a lot of information about it. Perhaps um <clears throat> make sure in terms of the tool and then are you tapping into and in learning about the constituency um and their uh health literacy do you think the tool is um that families will understand the questions you're asking uh, and that it will work for div diverse populations that are involved in this collaborative work so Yes, um, and I'm, I'm going to respond yes, because we did a fair amount of cognitive testing of the items in the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool and got a lot of feedback about terms that we should change or clarify, um, how, we worded um, ha how we worded things, and we did test um, the tool with families and with um, and with organizations staff from a variety of organizations um, to ensure the cultural competence and um, health literacy of the tool. Um, we're also getting ready to pilot the tool, and so if there are any remaining issues that we did not address, we um, hope that they will be identified. In the pilot. That's terrific. Thank you. <clears throat> really thoughtful work at every stage of the development of the tool. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, Vee, if you thought about the work that you've been doing, is there, you know, one or two lessons learned that really a pearl that you would like to share with the webinar audience today? Um, that was critical to the success of the collaboration across New England? Um, I think in, in terms of our particular partnership um, with Nurgen, I think, um, you know, it takes time. Family engagement takes time. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard for agencies to immediately develop a relationship with um, family organizations and vice versa. Like I mentioned, our relationship started 10 years ago, and um, we didn't necessarily get any grant funding. Um, we were not successful in any of the grants that we did, but we learned that we had to develop a relationship. So I think that's, that's the key that I would say, is that you have to build a relationship. You have to learn to work with you know, your cultural brokers. If you're a family organization looking to work with an agency, um, I think just you know, don't give up. Um, keep, keep beating down the door, knocking on the door, um, just like we were. We were persistent um, in terms of we, you know, we kept on applying and 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 we we developed a relationship. We went to the conferences that they had. We responded to surveys. We, you know, kind of we always had our hand up, saying, you know, we're here, work with us. And um, if you're an agency on the other side, I think like we had mentioned, is working, <coughs> learning the population that you're trying to reach out to and um, trying to establish a relationship with them, learning who their cultural brokers are. Um, and um, so that's, yeah, that's what I would think. 
Oh, wonderful, wonderful pearls. Uh, that it, this engagement takes time, and then the persistence on both sides. Um, we've always felt that it to build genuine trust which is key to working together, it, it does take time. So thank you for that thoughtful answer. I have another question for you, Beth. Um, folks have been following the evolution of the tool, and is there an updated version of the tool that's publicly available now before you do your pilot test? Is that available to the public, or do they have to wait a little longer? I'm sorry, you'll have to wait a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> we do want to complete. No, it's because we really do want to be thoughtful about about what we um, put out there, and we want to um, we want to incorporate. Um, the, the whole point of pilot testing is to see if there are things that, when the tool is actually put to use, rather than just scored, that work and don't work, and we want to address that so that we don't have to keep saying hold that thought wait a minute <laughs> there's something else that we need that we needed to address and and Beth another question came in that have you chosen all the pilot sites yet or is that still a work in progress that is a work in progress so um, we have selected some um, we have we have selected some but if anyone is interested please do um, email me and uh, I'll be happy to set up a time to talk to you about it. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question for all of you. Um, have, have any of you engaged an advisory council, a PFAC, to drive the work, or have any advisory groups been sparked to form as you engage those uh, patients and families? Um, this is Susan. I would say yes. Um, we we do have several advisory groups informing us on uh, our work for children and youth of special health care needs across the state. And again, we, we lean on our family-led community-based organizations to help um, staff that. And, you know, it, it's invaluable to us to get that info because as, as you could see in my presentation, what we thought were the priority issues were really not the priority issues of the families. So we, we've had to adjust our strategies and our thinking to really try to address needs. Right, Susan, thank you for sharing that. Um, for Nancy and, and Susan, another question has come in about have you involved youth um, in any of these collaborative projects? The wisdom now of Adolescents. Thank you, Bev. Um, this is Nancy. Yes, we have. Um, we are fortunate enough that our organization also runs, um, is, is one of the um, chapters of Kids of Self Advocates CASA. Um, so we have a Connecticut CASA here, and we have um, a youth group um, of ages 13 to 26. So pretty much everything that we um, do in our organization, we run through the youth and make sure that we incorporate them. If there's anything that has to do with them, we want their voices at the table. And so all our materials, everything um, goes through this, um, this, this advisory. It's not an advisory group, it's a, it's a youth organization. So yes, we do, definitely. Um, and we do that through you know, monthly meetings, um, providing materials to them to look at and kind of vet. Um, we incorporate them into all the projects that we have, including this particular one. And um, as part of their kind of youth engagement project, um, we'll be launching very soon um, a series of kind of public service awareness uh, about how youth engage um, in healthcare. And um, some of them do talk um, a, a lot about how they first got diagnosed with it, you know, if they have a genetic condition and how it has been to um, as, a, as a young person living with a disability or a particular genetic condition. Great, thank you. Thank you. Oops. And I'll, yeah. I was gonna say one thing, this is Susan, I, I'd say that's something that we do struggle with 
um, to try to get the youth voice. We've had various projects where, again, we've had to reach out to um, different agencies and organizations that work with youth. Um, but it's an area we can definitely improve on, and um, it, it, it can be it can be a challenge. Great, thank that's, you. That's can I just yes, okay. this is Nancy. Can I just quickly just add one one thing? Um, we're talking about family engagement here, but I'm so glad that um, this somebody asked this question because you know, family it is family engagement, but the families of whom you know, their children and their youth. So it's really critical for people, um, for agencies when they're thinking about to involve um, families of children of all ages, um, not particularly just younger children. So I'm so glad that question came up. And um, I can speak to some of the work that we're doing, Connecticut CASA and the National CASA is working on a project soon to be, um, soon to, to be out there to help organizations to um, consider youth engagement and how you get um, a youth engagement project or organization going. So you guys can stay tuned to that. You know, I think that's particularly important, important work that you're helping youth gain experience and expertise in being partners for improvement and helping to grow the next generation of individual and family leaders for this work. So thank you for that. Um, here's an interesting question. I'm going to read it carefully, and um, Susan, you may want to respond, but others may want to respond as well. Our health system serves a population of patients that come from a wide area, rural and poor. Over 65% of our patients are on Medicaid. Our senior leaders say they cannot compensate or pay expenses to families and patients because of a CMS ruling that says they cannot be seen to, quote, what doesn't, <laughs> the question says, incentivize patients. This is an age old issue, and I just wonder are we ever going to be able to get past it? That, I, that's an excellent question, and I can relate to that working for a state agency. So I think I have two thoughts. Um, one kind of like, if you build it, they will come. So if there's a way to go out to communities and um, invite families to a forum or a town hall, people people will come. Because they. And, and what I've experienced is that families have a lot to say and they want to be heard. Um, so if you go to a community, and offer that people will, will <coughs> have people come and talk to you and the other idea i have is to reach out to um like the family voices in your in your state every every state does have a um, family to family health information center which they that's their their expertise is around um health care and Talk to them and maybe brainstorm on how um, how you could achieve that because I, I think they would probably have some ideas and they they do represent the voice of families across the state so I would I would recommend reaching out to Family Voices to to see who your affiliate is in your state. Uh, Nancy or or Beth, any further comments on this question? Sure, this is Nancy. Um, I think, you know, we have to kind of, you know, we have to have a paradigm shift in how we consider family engagement um, and, you know, quote unquote, incentivizing. Um, I think, you know, if you really truly want family engagement, um, there's like, you know, Susan said, there's so many different ways and creative ways of going about that. But um, I think, you know, you, you know, you bring families to the table, you, maybe you can give them a stipend it's not you're not paying them to to get involved you're really providing a stipend so that they can come and participate maybe they're going to use that stipend for child care or you know for mileage gas mileage or you know stuff like that maybe you provide a meal or something um there's so many different and creative ways that you can do that but you know like she said contact the family voices in your state there's a, a parent to parent um also in your state or family to family and some of them like ours uh play all three roles and some of them are different um but i think we really have to shift away from how we have thought 
you know, we used to think about um, family engagement um, and really just think about, you know, this should be the thread throughout your whole program. And I think when you really, um, you know, make a commitment to it um, and, you know, you incorporate it by, you know, like I said, stipend or however, or maybe giving um, a, a small grant to that organization so that they can give the support to the families, um, that would be the way to do it. So this is Beth, and I, I just wanted to echo what Nampi had said, because um, many Title V programs do partner with the Family to Family Health Information Center in their state, and um, oftentimes that, in, that partnership includes some, some financial support. So um, to, to use either for a particular project or to help recruit families for, let's say, you know, for participating in the upcoming Title V needs assessment or, or some other activity. But if you, um, so even if the money is earmarked for something specific, that frees up money from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's investment in the F2Fs to um, actually have a line item to support, um, to support family part um, participation in these types of activities. We're seeing collaboration live in this webinar today. Thank you for all of you for responding to that important question. Susan, um, some folks on the webinar today wanted to learn more about the annual meeting that you have in New Mexico for families and champions and wondering what the content uh, is like in, the, in that meeting. So we, there's two meetings. Um, sponsored one by Parents Reaching Out and one by Epics, and they draw sometimes the same families, sometimes different families, but they have a huge response. Usually it's like they have about 400 participants at each conference, and it's, it's families that have children with disabilities, special needs, so it's, it's, a, gam it's a wide range of topics around healthcare, um, education, IEPs, Knowing your rights, I, I, the motivation I think is knowledge, is power. So you know, educating families on um, what they need to know to advocate for their children, and um, um, just a whole wide range of topics. So it's been going on for many years, and um, it's something that our program financially supports, I think, as I had, had mentioned, because it's a way for us to reach um, families across our state in a different way. So we provide money for stipends for families to attend the conferences. And oftentimes we, you know, as I said, we do joint presentations. So it was a great place. It's a great place for us to go and, and talk face to face with families and get a pulse on what, what the issues are, because it Families come up from all across the state to these to the to these conferences. Thanks, Susan. I know that was helpful to those on the call today. Um, there's an, another question um, comment about their work um, that they have been engaging families for many years and noticing a trend away from family advisory boards and toward family members being part of the team. I'm curious what tools are available to measure engagement in this model. I often find it hard to separate the family contribution from anyone else's since everyone is seen as an equal part of the team. What we're seeing is a little of both, which is really important. You, you need the larger advisory board, but you also need them engaged on key committees and work groups. What do the others think on the call and um, about tools to measure this kind of engagement and particularly the contribution of families in this model? So um, this is Beth, and I would say that's the kind that's exactly the kind of engagement that the family engagement and systems assessment tool was designed to assess. So Currently, because we're still in sort of the development pilot testing stage, um, I can give I can give an example. So for an activity like that, um, the tool right now 
is set up it the um, it's set up as four domains it's a paper and pencil format right now and um family uh family family members who participated in the initiative would score the tool they can score it individually and then discuss their scores amongst amongst themselves and come to a consensus score and organization staff who participated in the initiative would also score the tool. They can do it individually or come to a consensus among themselves. And then we encourage the participants to, um, to meet jointly, see where their responses to the items were different, were similar and where there might be some differences, come to a consensus score, and then we have an Excel worksheet that if you um, that that you can plug your you can plug your numbers into, and it will come up with an individual score for each domain and an overall family engagement score. And it all um, it will also generate graphics so that you, in addition to a number, you'll have a visual for the domains where the where there was a lot of success in, in, in engaging families, and there may be some one or more domains where there is some room for improvement. And then, um, so you can use it, the tool as a one-off just to score that a single initiative, and then moving forward, you might take what you've learned and improve it, or you can use the tool as a quality improvement for to um, to assess quality improvement over time, if it's an ongoing initiative. Any other comments on that question? We're almost to the end of the webinar. Um, I want to make sure we get as many um, of the questions answered as possible. Um, One of the questions was, would you be using the tool on a regular basis, Beth, or uh, is there a specified amount of time between when you would repeat it? Any thoughts about that? I'm, I'm going to say that that's, it's difficult for me to answer, but I would hope that it would be something that organizations use on an ongoing basis um, to to assess change in how they engage families over time. But the timeline clearly depends on if it's a time-limited project or if it's an ongoing project. Um, if it's an ongoing project, then you know they might they might set their own goals, you know, based on like every three months. If it's a one-off, like or a time limited project, then maybe they just score it once. And depending on what those scores were, the next time that that they start a new initiative, they use you know they take into consideration things, uh, uh, domains where they could do better, and um, either use internal resources or hopefully use the you know the toolkit that's companion to the tool to um, improve improve in those domains. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. I think one of the things we found with similar tools is the tool themselves are educational to all involved about what authentic family engagement is. And sometimes your scores go down because you're more discriminating about your answers. Um, so, um, but I think that the tool is going to be a great resource to the field. And I thank each of you today for your thoughtful discussion and responsiveness to all the wonderful people that have been on the webinar. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, we hope that you found this discussion informative. Um, in March, and Family Voices and the Lucille Packard Foundation will be at um, the MCHIP meeting. Um, and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, they will partner together in a session that introduces the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool that we discussed today. 
This will be at uh, the AMCHIP annual conference. Please be sure to, to join the team um, and meet in person um, if you're going to be attending that meeting. We will be talking more about this framework throughout the year, so please stay tuned to other webinars by the Lucille Packard Foundation. Uh, thank you again and have a great day.